Uh, okay, everyone. Um, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over week 17 here in the NFL. Uh, we are kind of back to normal and in that the games are on Sunday, so that's nice. Um, but we got a huge slate here. Full 13 games on the docket. Nine in the morning, which is tilting. Four in the afternoon. Uh, and really, I mean... Not a ton of spots where we've just got, like, obvious, you know, huge totals that we can target. Uh, of course, we have the Chicago-Detroit game. Uh, that's really leading the way here at 52-and-a-half, I believe. Uh, everybody else, um, at least in the early window, is kind of in the in the low 40s middling sort of totals-wise. So not a, a ton of super stackable games in the early window, Uh we do get some some pretty good spots down here in, in the later window. Um, that said, I think we're going to have to, when we're structuring teams, certainly in like single entry, three max type stuff, um, even in 20 max to a certain extent, I think we're going to need some exposure to these, these later games uh, because I find it pretty difficult to imagine many scenarios where it's just like, chalk Chicago Detroit that goes off and it's only guys from the early window that are in your teams um, so that's to say that you know you're gonna have to leave your flex open likely for somebody and you know the Minnesota Green Bay game for example um, but you may even need more than just one guy you, may, you might need two or even three uh, to capitalize I think there could be some some scoring down here in the uh, in the late games um, and if if we're not targeting just like huge totals, obviously the the Green Bay total down here is is the one uh, leading the way, forty eight and a half, I believe. Um, that there are pieces from the other games that we can get to, right? You can, if everybody plays for the Chargers, you can attack the the Rams passing game, right? We can attack Seattle, of course, with uh, with Mike White back. We can certainly attack Vegas, and we might we might be able to uncover some um some more interesting plays as well so uh lineup construction wise i think that's how we're gonna have to kind of focus maybe get a stack contrarian stacks from from up above uh or even just mix in pieces and then stack some of the later games you know th i think these are all viable so we'll get into it um but once again early week disclaimers it is a wednesday morning we've just got projections pushed to the site so those are up and and ready for um you to peruse at your earliest convenience um keep an eye out for ownership we still have some noise certainly fleshing out uh, a couple of guys still have jalen hurts we haven't even heard if he's going to play yet um i'd be once again pretty surprised if he does play because we we saw what Minshew did last week he was fantastic um and i think he is once again playable he gets another bad team so they don't. They don't need once again Philly to play Jalen Hurts this week. Uh, they would like to because they'd like to clinch the uh, number one seed as, as early as they can. Rather not wait until week 18, right? But um, against New Orleans, they don't need Hurts to do that. They can win this game with Minshew no problem. I mean Minshew is, is good enough to start for about half or more of the teams in the league. So. Um, couple other questions maybe uh in the, at least in the projections we do still have taylor heineke in here it is going to be carson wentz that was announced this morning so projection models across the industry haven't had a chance to adjust quite yet also in arizona uh for the cardinals not totally sure if it's going to be colt mccoy or um trace mcsorley so we do have some some questions here. I did, he may have been announced like overnight or something, and I just haven't seen it. Um, nevertheless, he is still McCoy, still in the models, and McSorley is not. So just have to keep an eye on that. Uh, I think we might, we'll talk about that game here in a sec, but um, might be able to target this game a little bit, I think. Outside of that, uh, we definitely have uh, two questions, of course. Um, it's looking, at least as of now, like it'll. It'll likely be Teddy, but uh, you can see here that we've got Tua still in the projections also. So a bunch of things are going to change as usual, um, but we'll just kind of try and 
and go through this quickly. Uh, I've already been yapping for like five minutes or whatever. So uh, let's get into it. We've got a lot of games to get to. We'll try and keep everything as short as possible. But uh, once again, um, feel free to speed this up. We might go uh, a little bit longer than normal. So um, let's get into it. Miami and New England. First game on the docket, you got New England laying about two, two and a half in the betting markets right now. Total 42, I believe. Um, bad offense here in New England in general. Really good defense. Uh, Miami, of course, we just talked about the, the questions with Tua and Teddy. Uh, their offense is going to take a significant hit. Of course, in efficiency, uh, if it's Teddy. Now, Teddy is not bad, right? Teddy can still chuck it a little bit. And the, the, the issue, once again, is, is New England's pass defense uh, and, and the run defense, for that matter, are both just fantastic units, two of the best in the league. On the ground, they only average, uh, they only allow 4.2 yards a carry and about 108 yards a game. Uh, through the air, only about 215 yards a game. And a lot of efficiency there, five yards, five adjusted net yards per attempt. So, um, not a whole lot of value necessarily, certainly not in the running back room, so you can't touch Raheem Moster to Jeff Wilson. Even though they're intriguing pieces, I like both of these guys. Miami's run off, rush offense the entire season has been poor, um, one of the worst units in the league. And on offense, only about 22 carries a game that they're giving to their running backs. So um, in order for, say, Raheem Moster to get there, uh, he's just got to perform you know, pretty outsized to his, his seasonal averages. Uh, and in this spot against New England, it's not something we, we want to target in general. Um, Tyreek at 8,900 is getting a little stiff, but Tyreek and Jalen Waddle, they're leading the league in yards per route run for receivers. So, uh, and that's realized yards per route run. Um, so you can play these guys literally every single week. You can even play them with, with Teddy. I would prefer to probably still get to Jalen Waddle, um, but we're not, I mean, we'd have to go back, I haven't done it personally, we'd have to go back to the few games that Tua was out and see how Teddy uh, managed the receiving core there, uh, see if we can glean a little bit of info in that regard um, as to whether he prefers Tyreek or prefer, just looks to Tyreek or looks to Jalen Waddle. Uh, more often. Uh, nonetheless, their price tags have, have come up quite a bit, and this is a bad fundamental spot, no matter who's playing quarterback, right? So um, Teddy, historically, is is mostly a game manager. He's not going to turn the ball over all that often, and he's not going to you know, beat himself. Um, so we'll put the team in good enough spots to win. So I would imagine that McDaniel down there is going to be uh, try to be pretty balanced or as balanced as possible and just and get out of New England with a win here. They're still trying to jockey for playoff positioning. So um, if Tua does play, I, I do naturally like the Dolphins a little bit more. Uh, it's the price tags that, that kind of keep me off of it. And I think we got to be a little bit sharper this week with the price tags with so many games on the docket. They're, we're taking a lot of risk when we're, we're jumping up here to an $8,900 wish wide receiver in a bad matchup when there's 13 games here. There will be guys that are far cheaper that will outperform Tyreek this week. It, it, it will happen. So um, something that we have to keep in mind when we've got so many games on the list. Um, but it would be the passing game if I'm targeting anything naturally as it is always with Miami as they are a full 64, 59% uh, pass heavy. So, um, if you want to make it a little bit cheaper, you could throw a deep tournament dart of Trent Sherfield. Um, that would be all right, but probably only in the event that it's too uh, not super enthused about that with with Teddy here. So um, overall, not all that interesting. Staying off the tight end and Gesicki, they just didn't get enough work. And Dolphins defense, 3,500. Now, Mac Jones stinks over here on the other side. I think uh, the problem with the Dolphins is that they are a, a – pass funnel defense. So um, even with a pretty poor offense in New England over here, it's not very efficient. They're about break even in the passing game, pretty poor in the running game. Um, we don't really want to be targeting you know, New England's offense or, or really kind of an overpriced uh, Dolphins defense there at, at 3,500. Um, kind of a stiff price tag there. So um, 
targets from New England. If we I, we do kind of like New England here, I think it's uh, an okay spot for their pass game. Um, Mac Jones is probably going to pop later on in the week in some projection models for you. And that's because of the price tag. He still has upside at this price. Uh, it just so happens that he's not very good. Um, yeah, but he he still has 25 point upside definitely in in this matchup against Miami. It would be Jacoby Myers. You can play him again at 5,000. This is fine. Um, you can also consider jumping down to like a Kendrick Bourne. He got a, a, a good bit of work last week. Uh, Devontae Parker has been out for the last couple of weeks. Have to keep an eye on him. I'm not going to deal with the Taekwon Thornton nonsense. Uh, Damian Harris has, has been out for a little while as well. He's dealing with a thigh. So if he comes back... Um, that would cut into Ramondre's work. The The issue with Ramondre is he's only seen like 25 carries, I believe, once this entire season. It was back in like week five. And it may actually have been against Miami, if memory serves. Uh, I, I could be wrong there, though. In any case, uh, we run into just volume concerns for Ramondre. We know that he's very explosive, and he has the upside to blast through this number. Uh, but once again, like Miami's... Rush defense is actually pretty okay, only allowing 4.3 yards and about 110 yards a game. So if Ramondre is not going to get 20-plus carries with a very high probability, it makes it a little bit difficult at this price tag to be targeting him. I think we can get to some cheaper running backs. Once again, 13-game slate, we can we can spread out a little bit. So that's kind of how I'd want to attack with the New England offense, be most of the passing game. Not super jacked about stacking Mac Jones, but um, I think one-off pieces of Jacoby Myers or deeper tournament darts with Kendrick Bourne are both playable. Uh, Patriots defense, I, I do want to mention here at 2600. They're popping really, really hard early in the the value metrics. Uh, 2600 this is a really good price. If, if it's Teddy, uh, I did mention that he didn't turn the ball over a whole hell of a lot, and they're... Un- not as likely to be throwing as heavily as normal. But if it's Tua, he's been really, really struggling over the last several weeks uh, and turning the ball over left and right. I mean, Miami lost that game against Green Bay because just, Tua just turned the ball over. Um, at 2,600, this, there's upside here uh, for this unit. This is a very, very good defense over here. Uh, there's upside not priced in. So I like that play a lot. Okay, let's move on. Um, oh, what are we doing? Cancel. Move on to Denver and Kansas City. Uh, okay, so Nathaniel Hackett finally got the hatchet, uh, as it were, and so did a, a lot of the rest of the coaching staff. So, I don't know. You, you want to play narrative? Denver going to respond to that? Well, I don't know. The guy they replaced him with was the game clock manager that they hired to help Nathaniel Hackett out, so that's kind of weird. Um, I don't know. This team is... is not very good, um, and in DFS, I think there's really only a couple of of playable pieces that we could consider. Um, we've been playing Greg Dulcich literally all season because they had been using him as a wide receiver. The issue I think we're going to run into is that they'll probably have three wide receivers healthy this week uh, with Judy Sutton and Kendall Hinton. Um, so that may relegate. I mean, it, like, Greg Dulcich, he's still going to be at least the number three pass catcher here. Uh, but Kansas City doesn't give up any production to the tight end. They're one of the better teams in the league um, in just raw fantasy points allowed. Just 12 fantasy points, DK points per game allowed uh, to the tight end. So not the greatest spot for Dulcich at 4000 and an elevated price tag. He's still okay to mix into your pools because he's going to get some work, uh, and it should still be Russ Wilson. We saw at the end of the game uh, against the Rams that uh, they brought in Brett Rippon, and he promptly threw in uh, just a fantastic pass to the the Rams defense (laughs) and had a return for a touchdown. So uh, unlikely that he gets any work this week, unless Russ is once again really, really, really bad. The issue with uh, playing Denver's offense really all season is has been that their offensive line is terrible. Russ takes a lot of sacks and puts them behind the eight ball a lot. Um, Chiefs actually do get a good bit of pressure, one of the higher rates in the league. So that kind of takes me off of playing some deep tournament, you know, narrative type of Denver stacks a little bit. I do like, however, Cortland Sutton at here at 5,100. Uh, I think he's a good price tag. Jerry Judy is okay at 64. I think he's he's a, quite overpriced. Um, I think this is pricing in 
that three touchdown game that he had a few weeks ago, uh, and the fact that he was literally the only guy that they could throw the ball to, uh, that's not going to be the case this week. So they should have a mostly healthy unit here with him, with Kendall Hinton back as well. Uh, so the passing game, although the Chiefs are are still attackable in in that regard, 225 yards a game and about 10 yards a catch. Um, shallower a dot so that would suggest that Cortland Sutton and could probably capitalize on some sort of normalization in volume and he is a bit a uh, shorter field receiver than is than is Jerry Judy so um, could see some upside there at 5100 not my favorite play of course because he's got uh, a really really bad offense here but um, it's workable if you want to consider this in deep tournament pools uh, Russ at 54, I, I, I just can't do it. Um, he's had literally one game this season where, or maybe two, where he cracked 20 points uh, on DK, and it, it's just not enough on a, on a full slate. You're going to need somebody to score here, and it's just not going to come from Denver in all likelihood. Um, but, I mean, I've been playing them all season, so you know, you, you're not going to get any argument from me if you want to run a, a Russ and a Cortland Sutton stack here. Uh, Broncos defense, you can still play them. Um, 2200 they're underpriced for how good the unit is. I know they got blitz last week, but that was mostly due to the fault of Russ Wilson. Uh, there, there's upside that is not priced in here. Um, once again, the issue with the Chiefs is that, well, number one, you get Mahomes and the Chiefs offense, right? They just don't take a lot of sacks, only taking about a sack and a half per game. So upside a bit nuked in that regard as well. And Denver is more attackable on the ground. So... Uh, than they are through the air. Still one of the best pass defenses in the league is the Broncos. So uh, what the Chiefs may decide to do is use a little bit more Isaiah Pacheco and Jarek McKinnon this week. Uh, I think we can play both of these guys in, in tournament pools. Uh, McKinnon, certainly, he's probably going to need Denver to score a little bit um, or just an outsized performance, right, uh, to catch seven, eight balls and score twice again, um, which is definitely reasonable. The, they use him in the screen game a good bit. Uh, there is still some upside here for Isaiah Pacheco in the the rushing game. Denver's defense not super attackable on the ground, only allowing four and a half yards carrying about 118 yards again, 117 yards a game. Uh, so they're slightly better than break even with respect to the league average in that regard, but it is the more attackable side. So we don't necessarily want to go after the passing game here with the Chiefs, even though they have incredible upside. What we have to keep an eye on is McCole Hardman. He may get activated this week from IR. Uh, if if that happens, that once again it takes me off MVS and off of Kadarius Tony, um, and it really to an extent off of Juju. Juju shit the bed last week with a flat zero. Not really sure how that happened, um, but it makes it you know with the more guys that they have active here, they'll even have. Sky Moore and Justin Watson, whatever the hell they're going to do. Um, they have so many weapons here on the offense that it makes it very, very difficult to peg who's going to get the production. And uh, as we saw last week, I think a couple of these guys had flat zeros, MVS and Juju. So uh, pretty frustrating to get after the Chiefs sometimes and just, just, I mean, just, just choose wrong, right? So. Um, that makes it difficult to stack Mahomes, certainly at 8,500. Uh, you are going to be you know, against a really, really good defense here. I mean, the Denver Broncos only give up 13, 14 aggregate points, uh, DK points, two quarterbacks. That's all season, right? 14 DK points. That is a micro number. I think it's the best number in the league. Um and you're paying 8500 for Pat Mahomes. So he obviously projects well, as he does every single week, but that's something we have to keep in mind. He may not need to throw the ball and throw for 303 in order for you to get it. You kind of need him to throw for 303 at 8500 So especially if you want to stack him with Travis Kelsey and his number one receiver, naturally Kelsey's price tag is going to keep his ownership down a little bit, but he's far and away the number one on the offense. So... Um, I think it, playing him is, is certainly fine. He would be my favorite piece because Denver has historically had, I don't want to say like mega difficulty, but uh, they've been exploitable with the tight ends or opposing tight ends. 
Um, and that's really kind of how I think I would like to focus uh, most often is with Kelsey and with somebody like a Jarek Mc Jarek McKinnon or an Isaiah Pacheco. Um, I'm probably going to come in underweight. Uh, and underweight to 5% is not a hell of a lot. Um, I really hate fading Mahomes, but on a full 13-game slate, maybe you just need to. It's going to make it really difficult to get there. It'll be contrarian for sure, so if you can make it happen and you land right, I mean, um, you know, more power to you here, but it's going to be very difficult to peg who gets the best production. Really, really good pass unit, pass defense unit uh, over here on the other side for the Broncos. 3,800 for the Chiefs. Ooh, yikes, man. Um, this is a stiff price tag for what's really just a mediocre unit. Uh, there is upside, of course, because Denver's been turned the ball over in spades. So um, you can always play the opposing defense when you get Denver on the other side. So it's it's not the worst, but they are very expensive and not certainly not my favorite play. Okay. Uh, we're already yapping so much that... Um, we're probably going to run really long here. So New Orleans and Philly. I like Philly here. They're laying about a touchdown, I believe, um, in the betting markets. Uh, once again, pretty low total, just about 43 and a half, 44 right now. So um, I don't know how New Orleans is going to score here. Like they, we got an interesting sort of price inversion this week with the quarterbacks. You know, I put that in air quotes. Taysom Hill is now 4,900. Dalton is 4,800. This just kind of goes to show that they are using Taysom Hill to spell Dalton as they have for the last month and a half or two months uh, more and more often. They just don't trust Dalton to be throwing the ball. And they're actually getting more production. It is not through the air, of course, but they're getting more production and more yardage from Taysom Hill than they are from Andy Dalton. That's just kind of a fact. The issue that you've run into with the Saints all season, Alvin Kamara has been expensive and their run game stinks they are not using him in the dump off game as they need to be so alvin Kamara is flat overpriced he's overpriced right i mean damn i i would say probably close to a thousand dollars here on dk there's just no upside whatsoever at this price uh, that will keep his ownership down so if you want to punt a 13 game alvin Kamara at super low ownership i mean you know, you'd go crazy but um, no thank you, not for me. Chris Olave, I have to keep an eye on him. Uh, he was out last week. If he is back, I think the price tag is good for him, and I think the spot is bad, right? And of course, he's got Andy Dalton here throwing it to him occasionally uh, at Taysom Hill. So n not really a, a good fundamental spot on his offense, nor is it a good fundamental spot to be targeting on the other side against the Philly defense who is a fantastic unit. They only give up 180 yards through the air per game. So really nothing from New Orleans for me here. Um, I do like Juwan Johnson still, 3,500. He got a price drop from, I believe, 38 or 39 last week. Uh, I think this is one of the few playable pieces on the offense over here. Um, still a big body and still going to get a bit deeper um, sort of A dot compared to other tight ends, right? And at 3,500, he's cheap enough that you can mix into the pool. Um, projection, pretty low so far, so something to keep an eye out for there. But uh, it, it is a playable piece. He's got a lot of touchdown equity, if they can move the football at all. I am hard-pressed to um, think that they will, but, uh, you know, that's... It, you can leave them in the pools. 2200 for the Saints defense. Same price as the Broncos. Um, no thank you. Again, like I'd rather play the Broncos against Kansas City than the Saints against Philly here, even against Gardner Minshew, who it's likely to be on the other side. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, Minshew is not bad. This kid can start for probably 60% of the teams in the NFL. He's better than a lot of these quarterbacks. Um I mean, he's not excellent, right? There is still variance. We saw at the end of the game last week that he turned the ball over in a pretty inopportune moment. Um, but this offense is good enough that he can just slip right in. And once again, they're still playing for the number one seed. They would like to clinch this next week so they can rest guys. Or they would like to clinch it this week, rather, so they can rest guys next week. Um, that would be ideal. So they're going to come out firing, and they're, they're going to try and win this game. So I, I do like the Eagles here. Um they are seeing a little bit of resistance at the 7. 
Uh, so you probably are not going to see it's literally as we speak dropping from six and a half or from seven to six and a half again. So they're playing that that sort of seven six and a half key number game in the markets right now. Um, but that said, I, there really isn't a hell of a lot of upside for New Orleans to be able to keep this game close. So I don't like them really at all in in DFS. And I think you can play the Eagles' defense on the other side. Now, 4,000 is tough to stomach once again. I'd rather play the Eagles at 4,000 than the, Keith, than the uh, Kansas City Chiefs at 3,800, for example. But uh, you know, nonetheless, 4,000 for a defense, not not great. Dallas Goddard, 4,700. He came back. only got three targets last week. Um, I think he's probably a bit overpriced here. And New Orleans has actually been fantastic against the tight end. They're only giving up about 7.5 DK points a game. That's probably the best number in the league. Uh, so they've been excellent. So no thank you on the Dallas Goddard. Demonte Smith, um, he's seen a price bump because of his production. 7,100 now, we're kind of getting a little crazy. But both of these guys, A.J. Brown and Devonte Smith, are uh, absolutely playable. I think now that the, the price gap is has closed a little bit, I think I'd prefer just to find the 800 bucks and, and get up to A.J. Brown. On a 13-game a, a slate, Finding $800 is a little bit easier than on a 10-game slate, for example. So um, prefer A.J. Brown to Devontae Smith, but both of them are playable with Minshew. Best spot here, I think, is going to be Miles Sanders, 5,900. Have to keep an eye on his ownership. Don't ever like playing Miles Sanders when he's popular. But uh, under 10%, I think, is, is a perfectly gettable spot. And the Saints rush defense, they give up 4.5 yards a carry, 130 yards a game. Miles Sanders, very, very efficient in the rush game himself. So if it is Minshew again, I think they'll try and they don't they're not going to need to pass the ball nearly as often as they did last week against Dallas. This isn't going to be a shootout. So I think you could see an uptick in volume for Miles Sanders here. And he's incredibly efficient, as I mentioned, uh, 5.2 yards carry if memory serves. So uh, very, very strong play here at 5,900. One of these cheaper running backs at lower ownership that I think we can keep into the pools here. Uh, you can play Gardner if you want. Once again, I'd play him um, with A.J. Brown. If Hurts plays, you can, uh, you can play him as well. But once again, you're going to run into the same sort of risk in buying a, an expensive quarterback. It's a little different with Jalen Hurts. Um, because he's got so much more rushing upside than a Pat Mahomes, right? But, um, you know, you could play him, but there will be cheaper quarterbacks that outperform him. So um, I would, I hope that it's Minshew, and I would play him again. I think it's a pretty good play. Okay, uh, moving on to the hapless Indianapolis Colts at the New York Giants. Um, I think the Colts are in an okay spot here. I think the Giants number in here in the betting markets, they're laying six, pretty much a blanket. Um, totals 38 and a half. I think that number is too high. I made it a little bit lower and I think there's a little bit of upside here for Colts to cover a number. Now their offense is terrible. Okay. Don't get me wrong, but Nick Foles is going to be the starter once again. And there's upside for him at this price. Now 5,200, um, he, we know where the targets are going to go. Okay, It's going to be Michael Pittman. It's a little bit to Alec Pierce, but it's also Jelani Woods. So I like these three guys here. I'm not touching the running back room with Zach Moss uh, or Deion Jackson, whoever the hell is going to get the most carries. Um, they've been an awful, awful rush offense literally all season. So this isn't due at all to the lack of Jonathan Taylor. Uh, they've, they've been terrible. They haven't been able to run the ball all year. So uh, it's only the passing game here. And against the Giants, they're still attackable. We most often want to attack on the ground. So there there is upside for the running backs in that respect. But even still, I, I'd almost rather side with a, a bad rush defense against a bad rush offense. I mean, I, I don't know. It's there, there's upside, and in, in deep tournament pools, you can consider a Deion Jackson, who's probably going to get more work, but uh, he and, and Zach Moss here are going to split the carries basically right down the middle. So, and, and we actually right now have Zach Moss projecting significantly higher. So um, kind of throwing darts there. So I'd prefer to just get to the passing game where I'm more confident that the, the volume is going to go. So that's definitely Michael Pittman. Um and they've been using Jelani Woods finally a little bit more over the last several weeks. So uh, 2,800 for, for Jelani Woods, I think is a really, really good play down here. There's only a, there's a couple of tight ends that are in the 
sub 3K range, I think you can consider this week. Uh, Jelani being one of them. Um, Alec Pierce, I think at 39, is a, a pretty decent tournament dart as well. And you can play stacks here. Uh, Foles, Pittman, Jelani Woods. Foles, Pierce, Jelani Woods. Uh, or Foles with just one of them. I think those are all playable constructions. Probably staying off the um, the Mo Alley Cox down here. He's probably going to vulture a couple of, of targets and catches from Jelani. But um, I think the Colts are, are going to... Probably being a little bit of a an up pace game here. Now Giants are are still kind of volleying for playoff position, I believe, as well. Um, so they are also going to need to come out here and win this game. So I think we can see a little bit of of a competitive atmosphere here. Um, so with the Colts, I like the passing game mostly. Uh, and if you're if you're stacking a bunch of the Colts, I probably wouldn't recommend that. But uh, you can also consider either Deion Jackson or Zach Moss. Um, Colts defense, 3,300. You can consider that. If they do keep this game close, since they do have a bad offense, uh, you could consider attacking Daniel Jones on the other side. The problem with the Giants, of course, is that they run the football so much, right? Um, it's not really as as much as it has seemed all year. As a matter of fact, it's only about a, a 53-47 split in favor of the rush. But um, they want to run the entire offense through Saquon and Daniel Jones. So uh, we did see last week that their passing game popped. But Brian Dable over here is usually pretty good about uh, attacking the biggest weakness of his opponents. And clearly last week that was the pass defense of the Vikings. Um there should be a little bit of upside in attacking the pass defense of the Colts. This way, you don't want to touch their run defense. This is an excellent unit over here, uh, allowing just four yards of carry and about 120 yards a game on the season. There, There is some touchdown equity for Saquon um, in that regard because most of the yardage is coming through the air against the Colts, and then it's just running backs kind of jamming it in there at the goal line. Um so we've got to be careful, though, once again, with an elevated price tag on Saquon here because Daniel Jones will also kind of vulture some of those touchdowns. So uh, I think Dimes is playable. He's projecting exceptionally well, as he really kind of always does at this low low price tag. Um, but we can also mix in, once again, each of his three pass catchers, probably staying off Daniel Bellinger, 3,200 again. The Colts uh, also really, really good against limiting are really good in limiting tight end production this season. So would prefer the wide receivers. They're far more attackable in that regard. Um, Darius Slayton got a, a price drop, and Hodgins and Richie James both got price increases. So that brings me on to Slayton a little bit more, but once again, these guys are virtually equal plays, and you can play any one of the three. It doesn't really matter. Uh, really only comes down to lineup construction and, and price tags. Uh, Giants defense, 3,900. No, thank you. Uh, I like the Colts a little bit here on the other side to be able to score. So not uh, not dealing with that. However, we did see that Nick Foles did throw a couple of really bad picks um, in his start. So it's reasonable to, to consider that. But at 3,900, I mean, this is not a very good unit, number one, with the Giants. So um, would be very careful with that. All right. Moving on to Chicago and Detroit, uh, biggest total of the week here, 52 and a half, I believe, and the Lions are laying a huge number. I mean, I've seen some interesting takes uh, across the industry um, with where this number is, has fallen. Uh, some guys have come in like, hey, I made the number Lions 8, and personally, I made it far lower. Um, because I still respect the Chicago ability to attack a bad defense. And Detroit is a bad defense. We saw that they got absolutely taken apart last week by the Panthers, who are a really, you know, a piss poor offense, to be uh, blunt. So um, I'm still looking to fade Detroit, as I have been the last few weeks. And I think this is an excellent spot for Justin Fields. We're seeing his ownership. Actually, compared to very, very early runs, um, you know, in the last 24 hours, he came in at 3%. So it's starting to uh, normalize a little bit as more of the industry is coming on to this. This is a killer spot for him. He's projecting about five full points higher than he was last week in a pretty decent spot against the Bills. Um, 
So, like, this is very, very playable. And if you get Justin Fields here, 7,900, I'd much rather play him than Jalen Hurts or, or Pat Mahomes. Uh, I'm pretty much at an 8-1 to one clip, I would say. Um, I think there's far more upside for Fields in this particular matchup. The, the Detroit is still awful. They, Including their their numbers last week when they gave up 200-some-odd rushing yards in the first half, I mean, they're still giving up over 5 yards a carry and 150 yards a game on the ground. Um, one of the worst rush defenses in the league, if not the worst. So terrible, terrible numbers. And that's how Chicago wants to run the offense. It's rushing the football. Justin Fields, David Montgomery. Now, David Montgomery, we got to be careful because Khalil Herbert did return last week. So he'll probably see an uptick in volume, Herbert. And at 6,900, I think there's cheaper running backs that we can play that aren't going to get vultured by the quarterback and a backup running back. Uh, near as often as Montgomery will. Um, he'll still get his 15-plus carries, you know, give or take, but it's not 20-25, which we're probably going to need in a full 13-game slate at this price tag. So uh, not projecting very well, and naturally that's keeping his ownership down. So probably not a lot of David Montgomery for me. I do like the passing game here a little bit, though. Uh, don't tell anybody I said this, but... Um, you know, we might be able to get to some Chicago pass catchers this week. You can play Cole Komet, 45 and not stoked about this price tag. Uh, it's a little elevated, and I think, as I mentioned, there's some cheaper tight ends that we could get to that I think I'd prefer. At the same price tag, if Chase Claypool plays, I'd prefer just playing him. Um, or, we can, if, if Chase Claypool is out, you can play Dante Pettis. I think both of these plays are really strong here to get to deep tournaments, uh, get to in deep tournament builds. Um, EQ St. Brown, we haven't been able to play him all season. Uh, still a no, and same with Nikhil Harry. So uh, Bears defense, 2,800. Once again, you just can't play them, especially against a very, very high-powered offense over here in Detroit. So that's a, a total non-starter. But I think you can play some Fields, Komet, uh, Chase Claypool, and some Dante Pettis, mixing them in. I wouldn't play two of these pass catchers on any one team. Uh, but I think... Skinny stacks of Justin Fields are, are very much warranted in this spot. Detroit on the other side, you can play Goff once again at 5,600. He always projects well, just similar to Daniel Jones. Uh, this is a very, very good number for him at uh, pushing 20 points. This is a high, high total, projection total, that is, at, uh, at 56. So this is a really good play. And once again, Chicago's defense is terrible. So we're expecting points here. we got to keep an eye on his ownership. As of right now, I mean, this is the highest total of the week, and nobody's playing this game. So, I mean, I don't know what the hell's going on. Um, outside of Amon Ra, like, of course you're going to play Amon Ra, but if you want to come off of that a little bit, differentiate some of your Detroit stacks, you can play some DJ Chark, 4300 Like this price as well for him. Uh, I think there's a lot of upside that's not priced in down here. Um, not chasing the Shane Zilstra freaking three touchdown game or whatever the hell's going on for the Brock Wright 65 yard touchdown passes any of that nonsense um we're not dealing with it could see something crazy like a Jamison Williams bomb or, or or whatever it is um but most often I think we want to focus on on a full 13 game slate where we know the targets are going to go and that's DJ Chark and that's Amon Ross St. Brown um, we have to keep an eye on what's going on in the running back room for the Lions here. Last three weeks, they've just been totally unplayable, and that's because all three of them are getting snaps. And you know, this week, we may see a little bit of a change in that fundamental um, overview there. J uh, Jamal Williams actually got rolled up on, I believe, or tweaked a knee or something at the end of last week. Um, he came out of the game, so we'll have to keep an eye on him. If he's out this week, I actually do like a good bit of DeAndre Swift. He could be a run back that you could consider uh, in your field stacks for sure. Uh, if he's in, I think I'm, I'm much less enthused about that, and I'd probably pivot my run backs to Amon Ra or to DJ Chark. Um, and I, if Jamal Williams plays, uh, once again, I mean, it just brings three running backs back into the room. So i um, really not excited about that. And that doesn't mean that if Jamal Williams is out, you could play Justin Jackson. Um, I mean, it's possible. The Bears run defense isn't anything to write home about either. Five yards a carry, 150 yards a game allowed, and, and nearly two full touchdowns on the ground per game uh, for them as well. So um, at 4,000, I think I'd rather play him than Khalil Herbert on the other side, for example. But even though Khalil Herbert's a you know, far better running back, um, I think this is okay 
to consider. Um, I'd rather play Justin Jackson here because I think the volume is a little bit more, or would be a little bit more solidified than a Jamal Williams or than a Khalil Herbert on the other side um, due to the existence of Fields and, and David Montgomery, right? So um, that's a long-winded way of saying I think we can obviously play the Detroit offense here. Favorite pieces are, are naturally Amon Ra, but I do like DJ Chark and DeAndre Swift really only in the event that Jamal Williams is out. Uh, outside of that, um, really nothing else for me, I think. I think we sh- we need to kind of be concentrated, stay concentrated on a full 13-game slate and, and just play good plays. So um, probably have to get this game right, but uh, I mean, it also wouldn't be surprised if, I mean, both these teams are bad. If both of the offenses just kind of shit the bed and nobody scores here either. I mean, that's that's well within range. Uh, okay, moving on. Arizona and Atlanta. I mentioned at the out the, out the outset, um, easy for me to say, that we can potentially target this game. And I think I, I like Cardinals here. Um, we'll have to keep an eye on Colt McCoy, as I mentioned. Uh, not sure if it's going to be him or Trace McSorley. If it is McSorley, it's 4900 for him. Um doesn't really matter. I, I personally, I, th- I think I'd prefer McSorley. I think he's a little bit better passer than McCoy, uh, even though he's bad. Um, but Mc- McCoy is also perfectly playable here at 5,200. Uh, Atlanta's pass defense is dreadful, and they've been attackable literally all season. Um, the Really, the only issue here that, that we would run into is pace. Uh, Arizona plays at a very, very high pace on offense and on defense. Uh, but Atlanta on offense really does it because they run a damn football so much. Um, at 33, 35 carries a game nearly. Uh, very, very efficient rushing offense over there for the Falcons. So that's the the issue that we would run into when considering Arizona stacks. But um, whether it's Colt McCoy or Trace McSorley, I like New Hopkins. Uh, don't really care. 7700 I think is a good price. And at right 5% ownership for top five wide receiver in the league um, as a a smash play every single week. Um, He's going to project at the top of the wide receiver room or near the top, uh, probably in the top 10, I would, I would guess. But I think Marquise Brown at 5,500, this is also playable, probably a little stiff in the price tag. I prefer McSorley for Marquise Brown a little bit, but um, that's really only because, um, you know, McSorley's just going to throw the ball a little bit more, I think. Now, Greg Dortch, he got 10 or 12 targets in this game last week with McSorley as a starter. So uh, that's a very viable tournament dart if he's going to get anywhere close to that kind of volume. Um, you know, he, I think, cracked 100 yards. If not, he was very, very close. Uh, at the flat 3,000, this is very playable against a horrible, horrible pass defense. Uh, one of the worst units in the league. 240 yards a game, 11.5 yards a catch, and a full 7.1 adjusted net yards per attempt allowed um, on the Falcons' side. Deep A dot, 8.5 yards per route. So, um, very, very attackable spot for the Cardinals' offense, even though the Cardinals' offense is not very good in general. Um, but you can play James Conner as well, 7,200. I think he's a little expensive, but... Uh, He's projecting as one of the top running backs so far this week. Naturally, the ownership is kind of flooding in. um, So that wouldn't be my favorite way to play this. I'd rather just get to the passing game, play Nuke, and play Greg Dorch, play some Marquise Brown. I think there's more upside there in that regard. Trey McBride, probably not. Uh, I do like the kid, but at 3,300, we just have volume concerns for him. The, The other A.J. Green and... Robbie Anderson type plays. They're just fully phased out of the offense, so no thank you. Cardinals defense at flat 3,000, also no thank you. I think they're a little bit expensive here, and I think we could see some sneaky points in this game. Despite the fact that it's only a 41.5 total, uh, Falcons laying 3.5 uh, right now, and I kind of like Arizona to cover that number here. So on the other side, um, we know Atlanta, They we know that they want to run a football. It's actually Tyler Algier now. Later in the season, he is emerging and, and really taking over the number one running back role from Cordero Patterson. Um, so at 5,300, I think this is the best play, no, one of the best plays in this game. Uh, I think he's a killer run back. But you can also consider, I mean, 
Cardinals pass defense is terrible also and they, they just give it up in space and they give up 26 points a game at a very high pace so you can certainly play Desmond Ritter as well in deep tournaments 5,000 once again there's upside for him at this price he looked a lot better last week despite getting a, uh, a more difficult defense um, Drake London still price hasn't moved so we can still play him one of these weeks he's he's gonna well hang on to the football number one uh, and really convert all of this volume into touchdown scoring. He's going to pop for a really, really big score. Uh, and and it's, it, it could very well come this week. So um, I think it's okay to consider Desmond Ritter in, in some of your deep, deep tournament stacks. Not 20 max or any of this nonsense. So, um, you know, milli type of stuff only. But uh, Drake London, you can play in pretty much everything. I would probably stay off of him maybe in single entry, just have upside concerns. Given the rush balance at a full 59% to uh, to the run game for the Falcons here, um, so I'd probably stay off of that in single entry and three max, but uh, 20 max I think is a decent tournament play. Um, Ole Zacchaeus, I uh, don't really think you can you can target the second receiver on a team that runs the ball this damn much. Uh, it's just it's just really unplayable. Falcons defense uh, also I am off. They're a bad unit, and I think Arizona is going to be able to put up some points here. So I think this is one of the games where we can target some some decent one-off value. Uh, you can also consider some stacks. Okay, um, Cleveland and Washington. Cleveland stinks, and, well, Washington's not all that much better. Um, Deshaun Watson, 5,800. Just given how they, they've been using him over the last five weeks or whatever, he's just not playable. You just can't do it. Um there's no upside for him yet at the price. When we see him down to the 5,500 range, then we can start to jump jump on board, and it's probably not going to be until next season. Um, we're still seeing you know, DPJ and Amari. Uh, their prices are dropping a little bit. I think DPJ, I've said it the last several weeks, I think he's the best receiver on the team here. Um, I wouldn't be surprised next year if we see these prices invert. I had no idea if these guys are even going to be on the team or whatever, but... Uh, he is the better receiver in my estimation. 4,700, I'd rather play him if I were going to play anybody. Uh, Washington, I don't really want to target the run game, pretty, or, or the run defense pretty much at all. It's a, it's a really, really good unit over here. And in this game, I think this is one of the ones you could probably do pretty well just crossing off. Uh, not going to be a hell of a lot of fantasy goodness to go around. Washington laying about two uh, anywhere from one to two in the markets right now. Total is just about 40, 41. So, um, not a hell of a lot to to get excited about here. So, no Amari for me. Uh, only piece would be DPJ, and given some of the other options we can get to, he may even be a little bit expensive. No David and Joku. I have no idea if he's going to freaking hurt a knee or stub a toe or something on the first drive of the game and he'll be out. I mean, he's just super, super tilting. I hate playing this guy. Um, and at 4,100, I think he's overpriced with a an offense that's not throwing the football nearly enough. They want to run the ball, um, but as I mentioned, Washington rush defense, fantastic. One of the better units in the league, only allowing about 110 yards a game on the ground. So uh, Nick Chubb at 73, I think he's still overpriced. Um, that doesn't even... You know, put me on to uh, a Kareem Hunt. He's basically phased out of the rushing game entirely, and they need to score points in order for Kareem Hunt to be viable. So um, I'd rather play uh, Khalil Herbert or uh, Justin Jackson or whoever the hell it was in Detroit um, at 4,000 flat than Kareem Hunt. Uh, Browns defense, 3,400. No thank you. It is going to be Carson Wentz on the other side. That was announced early this morning. But I, I did mention that the projection models haven't had a uh, full opportunity um, to totally adjust quite yet. So it is Wentz. Uh, we've got him in here, but once again, we've got uh, Heineke in here also. So um, really not a lot is going to change in terms of the actual number. Wentz might project a little bit higher. Of course, the ownership numbers, that you know, that'll ripple through a little bit. Um, not super excited about playing Terry McLaurin now. I think you can play him in cash. I, I have very serious concerns about upside in tournaments at 6,100. They just don't use him downfield enough, um, and they want to be a balanced offense. Once again, this is a Ron Rivera team, and his teams are typically, um, well, they, they don't attack weaknesses the, as best they should. So 
That said, um, how they want to run the run the offense is once again with balance, and the the best spot of the day is actually the running backs, right? It's Brian Robinson rushing the football against Cleveland rush defense. That is a sieve on the other side. The 5200, I think, this is a cheaper running back play that you can get to as well. Um, really like this in deep tournament plays, or deep tournament teams. You could also consider an Antonio Gibson at 5,000. He'll get some carries as well. And he's not going to need strictly pass game work necessarily to get there. They will split work, these two guys. So wouldn't get crazy with the exposures and get, you know, 25% Brian Robinson necessarily. But um, I think we can mix in both of these guys. Uh, the the pass game is going to be a little bit more difficult to get to. Um Simply because, like, they've got three, four different guys here, and they've unfortunately now got Wentz throwing them the ball. We know that Wentz has some variance, but at 5,100, there's actually a little bit of upside here for him at this price. So you could consider playing him with a Terry McLaurin. Once again, you're going to have upside concerns in tournaments. Um, I don't think this is a bad cash stack necessarily if you want to run it that way. Um you, once again, you got a little bit of upside concern. Curtis Samuel is okay at 4,400 as a deeper tournament dart, dart as is Jahan Dotson, 4,600. Not super stoked about the 46 price for Dotson, but uh, it is a, a playable tag. These two guys are basically equal, um, very similar to the Giants receivers. Um, Commander's defense, 3,100. I think this is okay, to be quite honest. They're popping a little bit in point per dollar score. Um, value metric, not so much, just because the projection is a little bit lower, but uh, I think you can mix in the commanders here for sure. We'll have concern as to how much Deshaun Watson is really going to throw the ball, and he's shifty in the freaking backfield, so he can scramble a little bit, um, and that might uh, decrease your upside or your your projected upside, I, I, I suppose, uh, for the commander's defense. So be careful of that. But uh, they're a playable unit for sure. Okay, Carolina and Tampa. Uh, Carolina blitzed Detroit last week. I don't think they're going to be able to do the same thing to Tampa this week. Tampa is somehow still willing ga winning games, and somehow they are leading a division at sub-500 or, or whatever the hell they're like. I don't know. Um, I'm not super interested in this game. I... It, like numbers sitting three in the betting markets total is about 40 once again just kind of a meh spot um there is some attack of, like on the other side with tampa we can attack the carolina pass defense we'll get to that in a second for the panthers here i mean the tampa defense is actually pretty damn good unit uh in in both phases they are very good against the rush about four and a half yards of carry which is average but 120 yards a game uh, which is above league average, right? So um, not a lot of scoring coming from the running backs, opposing running backs. Um, so the upside for Deontay Foreman, Chuba Hubbard, certainly not what it was uh, you know, last week, right? So probably t coming off of these guys at these price tags, uh, I think there's some cheaper guys in, in better spots that are likely to get a bit more uh, consistent volume than Deontay Foreman, Chuba Hubbard. Uh, DJ Moore, like, he pops literally every single week. He's owned every single week. Um, and I'm not really, like, he kind of got there last week. I believe he caught a touchdown pass. But it wasn't, like, a an excellent performance from him or anything. Because, once again, he's, he's got Sam Darnold throwing in the damn ball. Um, there's, there's just no upside for Darnold because he, he's terrible. And that obviously filters down to his receiving core. Um, and it... You know, they're directly correlated here. So uh, DJ Moore and Terrace Marshall, um, I obviously like the guys. I like the talents here for them, but uh, I do not like the guy that's throwing them the ball up top. So um, I don't think we need to be dipping down into the Visca and the Shy Smith sort of area uh, on a 13-game slate here. Um, plenty of other guys. Like, I'd much rather just eat it and play Terrace Marshall if I were going to consider something like that but um really not uh, my favorite plays over here because tampa is still that you know, a pretty decent pass unit um they suppress production a little bit there so uh really not crazy about about playing carolina if i were going to run it back we'll get to some potential tampa stacks here uh in a second would be with the dj Moore. 
Um, I think like it's still a workable price tag for him. It I just have upside concerns because the offense is terrible. So um, on the other side, this offense is terrible too. You know, like you still got Tom Brady back there, and they're still throwing the ball a full 65% of the time. But overall, this is a break-even pass de- or pass offense with respect to league average. And now we're starting to get a little elevation in the price tags here, right? Mike Evans has been terrible all season. He's still 6,500. Um, I, I think I think he's just overpriced. Now there's there's upside for him in this particular matchup, but they just haven't used him. And we also have drop concerns all the time with the. Uh, with Mike Evans. So I'd much rather just get to Chris Godwin. His target share and his volume share is pretty damn solidified every single week. I think Godwin is a cash play this week. 6,800 you can mix in to tournament builds as well. Um, certainly at lower ownership. I, I, I like this play a lot. He's going to pop a lot, and he could very well get 11, 12 targets in this game, catch 10 balls, and, and crack 100 yards and get in the end zone. Uh, I like this play. Uh, a pretty good bit. He's one of the more expensive kind of upper 6K receivers um, that are probably going to steam a little bit. This ownership will end up, I would guess, 12, 14% by the end of the week. But a uh, pretty good play here for Godwin because this is the most attackable unit in this game, and it's the Carolina pass defense. So that with Tampa's strength being throwing the football, um, you know, it's, it's just kind of naturally how we filter down. So not super crazy about getting to the running back room. Um, Carolina's rush defense is, is really, really good as well, just as good as the Tampa rush defense, um, basically equal in efficiency metrics in those regards. Um, so I would, you know, if I were playing one of them, it, it would, would still be Fournette. He broke out really, really well or strongly last week, I suppose. Caught a lot of balls, had some decent rushing production as well. Um, so he, he looked healthy, to be quite honest, which we don't get all that often with Leonard Fournette. 5,600, I think this is a, a tournament running back you can you keep into your pools as well. Uh, Rashad White, they'll use him a little bit in the passing game also. And still, they it seems like Rashad White is on the field for the most important drives for, for the Buccaneers here. So um, overall, the offense is bad, and we've seen that literally all season the team is bad so this could be a, a pretty boring game and don't be surprised if um you know you click on some chris godwin and he catches seven balls for 58 yards and that's it um yeah like that's very well within range here with this offense there's not a whole lot of upside but this is an attackable spot against carolina bucks defense 3000 also playable a uh, good unit and a bad quarterback on the other side so this is fine um, if Tampa is leading this game, then Carolina is certainly going to throw the ball a little bit, and they're not going to be able to run the ball. So there should be some opportunity for the Bucks to get there a little bit. Over 20 in value score is, is really kind of the threshold that we like to see um, for a defense. And at 3000 I think this is a, a playable price tag for them. Um, deep tournament stuff, you can consider both Russell Gage or and Julio Jones. They're using them very sparingly. Price tag's a little elevated for that. But um, you know these are deeper tournament darts that you could throw into your Tom Brady stacks if you're stacking him. 6,100, not my favorite play. I think I'd rather play some other quarterbacks here um, because even though they're throwing the ball a lot, I mean, they just have not been very good. And he's turned the ball over a truckload. I think Brady has uh, finally hit the end of the line here. So um, prefer just one-off pieces here for Tampa for the most part and maybe a DJ Moore run back, but not my favorite, even though they are going to probably garner a little bit of ownership as we get into the weekend. Okay, Jacksonville and Houston. Um, We are right at an hour here, and we've still got five games. So sorry it's going so long here, Um, but I'm trying to get through as quickly as possible. Uh, Okay, so we've got Houston, who is bad, right? But... They're not as bad as maybe their earlier season metrics suggested that they were going to be, uh, or as their record suggests that they are. Um, I mean, they're bad, right? But in terms of fantasy production allowed, they're really not that bad. Okay, They're one of the better um, suppression units, so to speak, uh, in the league, certainly against quarterbacks. 
They only allow 15 DK points a game against quarterbacks. That's a damn good number. 6,200 for Trev, even though Trev is, you know, Jacksonville wants to win this game, of course, um, and, and Trev has performed very well over the last several weeks, really kind of coming into his own. You could play him because Houston's, you know, a bad team. And if Houston on the other side keeps this game close, like they have been able to against uh, Kansas City and against Dallas, for example, then Trev could very well pop. And you could see it with Zay Jones. You could see it a little bit with Christian Kirk, not my favorite at 6,000. Because overall, Houston Texans also very good at limiting production against wide receivers. Really where you want to target the Texans is running backs. Okay, They give up over 30 DK points a game to the running back. And still five yards to carry, 170 yards in the ground, and a touchdown and a half. So um, that's Travis Etienne territory. He's far and away the best play in the game, but if you want to play it a little bit contrarian, you can play Zay Jones, you can play Evan Ingram. The suppression against the tight ends uh, has also been there pretty much all season for the Texans because this team has actually been very competitive, even though they've got very serious leaks um, that they haven't been able to plug, and it just causes them to lose games. It's mostly on the offensive side because they're rotating in 14 different quarterbacks. Still not playing Marvin Jones. He's still not free, so uh, still staying off that. Jags defense, 3,600. Eh, not my favorite play here. Uh, I think Houston may be able to um, compete a little bit in this game. I think the Jags defense is attackable through the air a little bit. Um, so I prefer to, to get to their offense mostly. And favorite piece is... I think my favorite piece is outside of ETN, right? He's the number one for sure. It would be Zay Jones after that. Not super crazy about playing stacks, but uh, I think you can play some Trev and Zay, Trev and Ingram, uh, or, and even, of course, mix in some, some Christian Kirk. If you want to stack that, how are you going to run it back? Well, it's probably just going to be uh, Brandon Cooks or Chris Moore. Um, now, Royce Freeman, he's going to be I – mean, Damian Pierce is out, right? He's on IR. Um so it's going to be Royce Freeman and Dario Gumbawale in running back. I mean, they're going to mix in Rex Burkhead as well. Like, they'll throw him one pass down on the goal line or something. He's going to vulture it from somebody, but that's it. That's all the volume he's going to get. So he's unplayable, certainly at 4,800. Uh, but it's Royce Freeman that's going to get most of the work. The, the I mean, Jacksonville rush defense is about league average. Okay, They only give up 4.2 yards a carry, but a lot of attempts per game. So there is a little bit of upside in that regard. Overall, the Jacksonville defense is about league average, right? Uh, they, they are ex exploitable more so through the air. So I would prefer to get to Brandon Cooks and the Chris Moores here. Like Chris Moore at 4200 this is a decent price. Um, but I think Brandon Cooks, he came back, caught a touchdown pass last week. And at 48 this is a, a pretty decent play as well. Um, certainly number one receiver under 5000 uh, you you can play it literally every single week from pretty much anybody. So um, if you are going to play some, some Royce and, and you are playing some super expensive guys, um, once again, not my favorite, but he could very well get 15, 18 carries here. And at 4,600, a lot of the lack of upside is kind of priced in there. So you may only need 20, 22 points from something at, at this price. Uh, and then you can flex in a third, you know, running back from like the later game you can flex in a cmc or a dalvin cook or, or an aaron jones or something like that uh austin eckler down here if you want um to sort of normalize your uh, lack of upside uh that you would be assuming when you play a royce freeman 4600 or something like that so it's playable in deep tournament stuff um only deep tournament stuff don't think you can play this in in 20 max necessarily um but if you do something crazy and run like Jacksonville stacks and run it back with a Royce Freeman or something, uh, I don't think that's the worst construction uh, on the planet. Uh, Davis Mills and Jeff Driscoll are both getting snaps here, so neither of them are playable uh, at 5,000. Rather just play a, uh, where is he, Nick Foles up here, 52 or whatever it was. Uh, there's just other guys. Or even a Desmond Ritter at the same price, right? Um, so no thank you from the Houston Offense outside of Cooks, Moore, and maybe a little bit of Royce Freeman. Uh, Houston defense, 2,500. Uh, also not playing them. 
Okay, let's get to the afternoon games. Try and get through these as quickly as possible. Um, San Francisco, good football team here. They get a bad football team on the other side in Vegas. Um, however, okay, don't tell anybody that I'm going to do this, but I'm kind of looking to fade San Francisco a little bit. They've won eight straight, and that is not very common in the NFL. Um, Vegas over here has the offensive weapons. Um even though they're not all that consistent, they're there. And they can exploit San Francisco here. Uh, Josh Jacobs and Devontae Adams are two of the best in the league um, at their respective positions. And if Derek Carr didn't turn the damn football over five times a game, then Vegas could compete here. Um, I, I think we're getting a little enamored with uh, the Brock Purdy season. And, I mean, they're laying a full six here on the road. Naturally, that's mostly because of the San Francisco defense. This is a very, very good unit. You can play them literally every week. They're underpriced here at 2,900. Uh, this is a really, really good play because Derek Carr still does have a tendency to turn the football over. Um, but that said, I, I, I think that number at, at a full six is probably a bit aggressive in a vacuum. And once again, teams just don't win nine straight football games in the NFL all that often toward the end of the season. Um, I think in a vacuum, if you faded every single team that ever won eight straight and you faded them in their ninth game, you'd probably make a, a pretty good bit of money. Um, so that said, like I, I don't like attacking and, and deliberately seeking out really good teams, especially on full slates um, or anything like that. But I think that we can... We can target this game for some points, is, is I guess what I mean to say. So, um, CMC, he was a poor play last week, I thought. I came in well underweight, and you know, Washington's defense is actually very, very strong. And, and so, like, San Francisco put up 70 points or whatever, and CMC had, like, nine DK points or whatever it was. You know, like, um, I think he's a far, far better play, even at a more expensive 9,000 compared to the 8,800 that he was last week. Far better play this week because Vegas' rush defense, also pretty good, but I think there's going to be some points here. So in that respect, I think CMC is likely to be used in the passing game a little bit more. Um, last week was just not the case. They didn't need to use him. So I think you can play CMC. Once again, 9,000, you need 30 out of him, and if he doesn't get there, you're, you're just dead in the water on a 13-game slate. So uh, you got to be very careful when we uh, expand the slate size and and start expanding our uh, our price ranges for guys that we're willing to buy. Brock Purdy, 5,500. think this is playable as well. Um, if we do think that Vegas is going to be able to compete here a little bit, then Purdy's going to have to throw the football. 55, I mean, this kid's capable also. Um, I'd probably prefer Minshew. In, in most scenarios, but uh, if you want to, if it, like if, if Minshew steams or something, um, he won't. But if you want to get the same sort of construction and just mix it up a little bit, I think he, coming down to Brock Purdy is perfectly fine. Kittle caught 14 touchdown passes last week, uh, 5,900. Now he, he's priced probably where he should be. I think a lot of the value is actually... Um, has been extracted over the last several weeks. So not my favorite tight end play. I'd rather get to somebody cheaper on a full slate. Uh, Brandon Ayuk, though, I think this is a killer flex play at 6,300. Nobody's going to play this guy. And he's still the number one receiver with Debo out. Um, I believe Debo is still going to be out. Uh, unlikely to, to see him uh, in a game that San Francisco doesn't really need to win they are jockeying a little bit, I believe, for the number two seed in the NFC. Uh, I don't think they can win the the one seed, right? So um, that's really all they're playing for. So they're still going to want to win the game, right? Uh, but outside of that, um, not sure that uh, they they've really got a hell of a lot, um, you know, to to really like kind of go after here. So that said. Uh, they probably wouldn't play Debo even if he is available to come off of IR. So uh, Brandon Ayuk, 63. I thought he was a pretty good flex play last week. Um, I think he's a good play, flex play again this week. And and that's mostly due 
to the very low ownership here. Uh, I'm not super excited about the price tag, of course. I wish he were like 5,800. If that were the case, like, yeah, I'd have like, I don't know, 30% of the guy, I, I would guess. Um, Juwan Jennings, I think, is also okay for expecting points in, in this game. 3,600, one of the deeper tournament darts you could consider. About a 20 value score for somebody in the 3 to 4K. It's fine. Um, certainly playable. Not dealing with any of the other garbage. Uh, I did mention, even though I'm kind of on Vegas here, that uh, 2,900 for the Niners defense. Uh, best defense in the league um, in aggregate. And... They're gonna they're popping really hard two and a, you know two and a half point per dollar and mid twenties value score is fantastic for defense. So with the tendencies that uh, Derek Carr has to be awful, uh, I think that's very playable. That said, fifty three hundred there's upside for him at this price. He could pop certainly. Uh, this is a, admittedly a terrible terrible fundamental spot for him. Uh, he's probably going to struggle. The 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 best way I think we can attack with the Raiders here is is probably not with Josh Jacobs. 7,400 um, is probably a little expensive here for Jacobs in, in such a bad matchup. He is still going to get a lot of his value in rushing the football, but San Francisco gives up 3.3 yards a carry and 75 yards on the ground. They are elite in rush defense, and even though Josh Jacobs is used in the passing game, um, certainly not my favorite play. So I'd rather just get to Devontae Adams, pay for it. I think this is a really, really shrewd late window flex play as well. Uh, sub 10%, and we know that Devontae Adams has 35, 40 point upside as well. Uh, if Vegas is going to keep this game close, it's going to come through him um, in most scenarios. Hunter Renfro at 4,000, think he is a you know, 3 to 5% dart that you could consider as well. Not so much on the Mac Hollins. Um, Red Pro's just going to get more PPR work. Um, probably wouldn't even consider either, either of these guys on Fandle, to be quite honest. But uh, Darren Waller, no thank you. They just don't use the tight end nearly as much as they should. And that's pretty much how I want to attack. I think it's we know where the volume is going to come. It's going to come to Jacobs. And it's going to come to Devontae Adams. So if you want to run a full three stack and then run it back with a, a Brandon Ayuk uh, or a CMC or something like that, is a really cool late stack that not a lot of people are going to be on. So um, a lot of upside there in the events that there are points scored in this game. And let's check the total real quick. Uh, I've lost it. It's about 46. Okay, so that's not nothing. Plenty of other games up here have been at about 40 or whatever. So this is one of the games where you could see some scoring here, certainly from both sides. I think both quarterbacks are playable. Um, Raiders defense, no thank you. 2,300, even though they're cheap. Uh, I mean, that, that could be a route that allows Vegas to keep this game close, that they pick off Brock Purdy and run in for a touchdown or something. 10% uh, ownership. Uh, get out of here with that. No thanks. Um, okay. Jets and Seattle. I think there could be points here as well. It's going to be Mike White. He's back. 5,400. And we know that he could chuck it. And we know where the targets are going to go. It's going to be to Garrett Wilson. He's actually projecting higher than his quarterback. Um, I think this is a pretty good play. 5,500. Really like the price tag. And I really like the spot. Seattle's pass defense is awful. And we can attack them as we've been attacking all week. Uh, or all season, rather. Um, their rush defense, certainly bad as well. So that would normally put Bam Knight in play at 5,100. And I think it still still does to a certain extent. However, the Jets' rush offense, they only average 4.5 yards a carry. Just 100 yards a game. Not super efficient over here in, in the rush department. Um, is New York. So not my favorite to get to him, but he, he's absolutely playable um, in in your tournament pools. Corey Davis, 37. Uh, I'm probably staying off of it, but uh, he's one of these you know mid-20 type of uh, 3,600 pieces, 3,700 pieces or whatever that is actually a pretty damn good play. Um, so I, maybe I won't stay off of it. I'll have to look into this a little bit more. But uh, as of right now, the value metrics are, are popping a good bit for this Jets pass defense, or pass offense, rather. Uh, who I do like is Tyler Conklin. Same sort of deal, two and a half 
point per dollar and mid 20s value score 2900 here uh, for the tight end I think this is one of the cheaper tight ends that we can get to in the later window I think this is a an interesting way to um, to structure your teams and a, a cheap way to get more exposure to this late window with a little bit of upside he's got upside at this price for you know 20 points or so and that's really all you need at 2900 even in tournaments I think that is perfectly fine Jets defense 2800 They've been the best unit on the field in most of the games that they played, and they still are here. Um, we saw last week that the Chiefs pretty much totally dismantled the uh, Seattle offense, and the Jets' defense is really actually similar in terms of pressure rate that the Chiefs is. So there could be a little bit of upside still uh, for the Jets' defense to get to Geno. He still gives up two and a half sacks a game, or takes two and a half, rather. And, you know, Jets uh, are pushing 2.7, three sacks a game uh, defensively as well. So there's a little bit of upside, and Seattle certainly does want to throw the football. Um, the more attackable unit is the Jets' pass defense, even though it's it's pretty good. Um, there's a little bit deeper A dot for them, though. So they're kind of a, a, a bend and don't break type of pass defense. And... If we get Tyler Lockett back this week, I think that would be a pretty decent play. Now, I, I have mentioned on several occasions that I don't want to deal with wide receivers and finger injuries. The guy had frickin' surgery literally last week. If he plays, I'd be shocked. And, it, I mean, I do like the fundamental spot for him, but he's got a busted finger. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the 6,600, I'm not super crazy about it. And not projecting all that well for a guy, you know, in the mid six Ks. I'd rather just get right back to DK Metcalf. Um, Marquise Goodwin, he's been dealing with a wrist. He actually came out for most of the third quarter last week um, because he landed on it funny. Uh, there was some tape that came out. He's literally laying on the field, shaking his wrist in pain. So um, probably one of these guys, even though he's going to be a solid number two in the offense and pass offense here. Um, probably one of these guys I'd, I'd prefer to stay off. I think there's going to be an increase in variance and, like, drop ball kind of variance uh, that, that you'll see with this. You could also land funny on it again and just, like, come out of the game. You know what I mean? So uh, I'd rather just get to DK, who I know is healthy, who I know is the number one and is going to get most of the work. Kenneth Walker, 6,200, uh, probably not in this in this matchup. Jets run defense is fantastic. Four yards a carry, 114 yards on the ground allowed per game. So um, tight ends, 3,400 for, for Noah Fant. Uh, no thank you. Jets also very good in defending the tight end. So uh, same thing with Will Disley, just, just not dealing with it. Travis Homer is questionable. So if he is out, then Kenneth Walker, I mean, they're not, they're not going to have anybody else. I suppose they got DJ Dallas. Um, or you know whatever other 18th string running back they can they can bring up from the practice squad, but um, so that would bring me on to Kenneth Walker a little bit more. I do like the price tag, admittedly, but uh, uh, it is a, a bad fundamental spot for him. Um, Seahawks defense probably not. I think the Jets are going to be able to score here a little bit, so I prefer that side and run it back with a DK Metcalf something like that. Okay, uh, big game in the afternoon: Minnesota at Green Bay. Minnesota is a sieve. And I have no idea how they've won as many games as they have this year. They are running mega, mega hot. Um, I think Green Bay can win this game. I'm not sure if they they really will. Uh, because it's it's hard for them, their offense, to, to really exploit opposing defenses uh, in, the, in the best ways that they should. It's because they don't have a hell of a lot of upside uh, outside of their running back room. Um, Justin Jefferson... It, we're running into the same problem. You can play this guy literally every single week against anybody. It doesn't matter, but it's 95. He's 9,500, and on a full 13-game slate, there are going to be guys that will outperform him um, in most scenarios. Now, he's one of the guys that I, I kind of balk when I when I say that because he could very well put up 50 and, and lead the slate, um, and he'll probably do it more often than everybody else would, but in most scenarios... At 9,500, it's just it very, very hard. You're going to have to punt several spots in order to make this happen and, and not sacrifice upside. 
right? So um, really difficult to get to, and that's what's going to keep his ownership down. So if you can figure out a way to make it happen, by all means, you can always play Jeff, uh, Justin Jefferson. Kirk Cousins, though, if you want to stack him with it, like he's a $6,400 quarterback. So in order to make this happen, you're probably going to have to get down to a cheaper quarterback like a Nick Foles or Mike White on the on, in the Jets game or something like that. Derek Carr, Goff, um, all of these dudes that I'd much rather play than Kirk Cousins, 6,400, even though he's probably going to put up 25 or 30 again as well. Uh, Dalvin Cook, I think this is the most exploitable spot for in this game. And well, outside of you know Green Bay pass offense, but Dalvin Cook is actually good. Seven thousand, once again, excellent price. And you know we're just gonna have to keep eating it. I think uh, the spot, the spots are just too good. Um, and going it like in the event that Justin Jefferson and T.J. Hawkinson and Adam Thielen don't garner all of the scoring, like they're gonna have to score in order to to keep this game close. They could very well just get blown out, of course. We've seen that before. But um, I, I like Dalvin here at 7,000 once again, and then I'm going to play him once again, and it's probably going to burn me once again. Um, pass defense for Green Bay is actually pretty okay. Uh, Jair Alexander is, is pretty damn strong um, cover corner over there. So he's going to get J.J., and that's going to be a really good battle to watch. J.J. is probably going to win it. But, um, you know, that could open up some opportunities for Adam Thielen here at 5,200. Also for K.J. Osborne, 4,600. I think these guys are deeper tournament plays that you can consider. Uh, Thielen, probably not a cash play like he was last week, um, even though he didn't really get there. But, you know, the same thing with Hawk, right? Hawk is the very clear number two receiving option in the offense. Finally popped for all of the scoring upside that we know he has. So, um both of these guys are, are playable, and you can see a, a bit of an uptick in volume since J.J. gets a really good corner over there. Um, Vikings defense, no thank you. 2,700 is a bad unit. I, I just don't have any interest in playing them. Now, Rodgers is kind of washed as well. So there's maybe a little bit of turnover upside for him, and they're going to be throwing the ball because that's the most attackable unit for you know for the, the Vikings over here. So... Um, 2700 is not bad. Like It's an okay price, but not my favorite play. I'd rather just play the Patriots, 26. Um, 6004 Rodgers, he's similar to Brady for me here. Uh, it, it's, an, it's a good spot, and he's a good quarterback, but he's old, and the guys around him, um, I mean, in Brady's case, the sort of offensive identity just stinks. In Rodgers' case, same sort of deal, but... He's also got far less talent. Uh, like Godwin and Mike Evans are far better than Christian Watson and Alan Lazard. So um, Christian Watson, 5,900. He looks pretty expensive to me. I think there's plenty of other guys I'd rather play, like a uh, Garrett Wilson in the Jets game, 5,500, for example. DJ Moore, I think I'd even rather play than 59 um, for Christian Watson. DJ Moore, 57. Right, Alan Lazard, I'd, he'd probably be my favorite. Price adjusted play at 5,400. Think this is fine, uh, but both of these guys are basically equal. Um, so I'd rather just save the 500 bucks here. Uh, Romeo Dobbs probably not at 4,700. Don't think we're gonna need to get this deep and pay this much for it. I do like Aaron Jones, 7,100. This is an attackable spot. They'll use him a little bit more in the passing game than they will AJ Dillon. <laughs> So it takes me off of A.J. Dillon, 5,800. Uh, not the greatest spot against Minnesota's rush defense. Four and a half yards carry, 120 yards a game. It's fine, right? Is there tournament winning upside for him at 5,800? Eh, I don't know. I think there is tournament winning upside for Aaron Jones at 71. And at low ownership, one of these late game sort of flex plays that you can consider as well. Um, not super crazy about getting to stacks, but you can always stack the offense that's, that's playing Minnesota. Uh, the total in this game, 48 and a half. I believe the second highest total of the game or the week to the Chicago Detroit up here. Um, so it's very, very much playable. Green Bay is actually laying three and three and a half. I have no idea how that's the case. Um, so I like Minnesota in that regard. So we can kind of take that... Um, and, and, and build our DFS teams thusly, right? So uh, favorite way to play this would be like 
I don't know, probably just one-offs, to be quite honest. Uh, if we are stacking, I think it's Aaron Rodgers, Alan Lazard, and Aaron Jones for full stacks. Packers defense, also no thank you. 2,300, however, they are cracking the 20 in value score, so it's not the worst play in the world. And if you land on them, it's not too awful because Kirk Cousins can definitely turn the football over, but this offense can score over here, man. And defense... Uh, in Green Bay really isn't all that good. Very, very bad in run defense. Giving up five yards carry, 150 yards a game, and just break even relative to league average in pass defense. So uh, not the greatest spot to be playing them, but this would just be a price and value adjusted play. Uh, okay. Rams and the Chargers. Last game of the day. We're running really long here, guys. Sorry about this, but we got 13 games running about an hour and a half. Um, honestly, thought I'd be pushing two hours anyway uh rams here despite my adoration for baker mayfield um that is said in jest by the way I, I can't stand baker i think he stinks uh i think the rams offense here is actually you know semi-playable um nobody's gonna play it number one right so so we like that well they're bad so nobody should play it but I think there's a little bit of upside for Baker. He doesn't have anybody to throw the ball to outside of Tyler Higby and Tutu Atwell. You know, you want to play Van Jefferson? I mean, eh, whatever. Uh, not at 4,000. Rather, just play Tutu. And at 3,600, once again, he's popping as one of the best value scores down in this price range. So he's very playable, 3,600. Do you want to play him with Baker? I think it's okay. There's other quarterbacks down here. I think I'd rather play a little cheaper, a couple a little more expensive. Um, and they're just flat out better. So not my favorite to get to, to Baker in stacks with Higby and, and Tutu Atwell, but um, I think a one-off Tutu Atwell is a pretty damn good play, to be quite honest. Cam Akers really like this. 61, he popped a little bit, like finally. We, we've seen just a pitiful, pitiful offense. Uh, in, in the running department, rushing department for the Rams all season. One of the worst rush offenses in the league, averaging 3.8 yards a carry and 90 yards a game. That's terrible. But uh, finally, Cam Akers popped a little bit um, with the aid of Russ Wilson. So he's my favorite play of this game here because the Chargers' run defense is terrible. 5.3 yards a carry and over 140 yards a game allowed from them as well. So that's definitely the most attackable way that we can approach this game down here, or at least from the Rams' perspective. Um, like Cam Akers, like Tutu Atwell, you can, of course, play Tyler Higby. Again, he's the number one receiving option. So um, perfectly playable down here. I think you could see some sneaky points. Now, the total is just 41, give or take, and with the Chargers laying 6.5. I think that number is a little aggressive. And that's simply because Chargers, I don't really think, have a hell of a lot to play for. Now, I could be wrong about this. So we'll have to check on their playoff scenarios. But they clinched, and they're in. If they can't jockey for seeding and um, you know improve their standing all that, that much over the next week or two, then they may very well sit some of these guys. Um, that's definitely more a risk next week. But uh, it could be a risk this week as well. So you could very well see... Justin Herbert play two series and, and take a seat. And it could be the um, the Chase Daniel season, right, coming in after that. And that would totally nuke all of the Keenan Allen, all of the Mike Williams exposures that you have, and probably Austin Eckler too because, like, Herbert might not be the only one that sits, right? The, all of these guys could come out, uh, and the, it could just be like the Josh Palmer, Josh Kelly, DeAndre Carter sort of show – um, for the Chargers, and, and that is a realistic outcome. I'm not sure how probable it is, but it's something you have to keep in mind if the Chargers can't uh, improve their, their playoff standing at all. Um, I'm not totally sure about that, so check on that, but something to, to be aware of. Um, if everybody plays, then the most stackable unit against the Rams is the pass defense, right? It's not the run defense, pretty damn good over there. They allow just four yards of carry and about 100 yards a game on the ground. So um, you can play Herbert, you can play Keenan Allen, you can play Mike Williams. The prices are a little elevated, I think, uh, it, but I don't particularly care. Um, if they can, if they do need to win this game, then the Chargers, I think, they're going to be 
coming out chucking it, right? So it's going to be Keenan Allen. It's going to be Mike Williams again. Um, and Justin Herbert is likely to perform pretty well in those scenarios. Um, so I don't think, I mean, first of all, Josh Parmel is, is overpriced. In the event that those guys sit, uh, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, then Josh Palmer probably becomes the best play of the week, even if it is Chase Daniel back here with him. So, um, you know, a lot of stuff to kind of keep in mind. I didn't really discuss this a whole hell of a lot as we were going through the games, but this sort of dynamic may persist for other teams as well. So uh, keep an eye out. We're getting to late, um, you know, late in the season for all of these, all of these teams. And we might run into some of these problems. So, uh, Gerald Everett still not playing him at 4,200. There's a little bit of upside for him for, I don't know, four catches and 52 yards or whatever. You know, maybe a score, but not a whole hell of a lot. I think there's some cheaper tight ends I'd rather play. Chargers defense, no thank you, at, at 3,700. Now, Baker stinks, right, uh, on the other side. But they are too expensive, and I don't think this unit is all that good. Uh, value score and point per dollar wise for a defense, we could... We got plenty of other things to choose from. I don't think we need to be paying 3,700 for a defense this week. Uh, okay, so that's pretty much it, guys. Once again, sorry it's so long. We're about an hour and a half, um, but we got 13 full games here. I'm doing the best I can. So uh, keep an eye out for projections updates. Um, as usual, we will have those pushed out in the next couple of days. Keep an eye out for injury news, playoff seating, all of this kind of jazz. Uh, you really got to be sharp this time of year because there's a lot of variance going into the last couple of weeks. So um, really, really good tournament slate. And, you know, I'm not even going to go over full stacks here. I don't think there's a whole hell of a lot of – I mean, you could play pretty much everybody, to be quite honest. But um, nothing that we want to, like, super attack. I mean, there, we obviously have favorite plays. Uh, you can go back and, and watch the individual game breakdowns for those. But I think – you can get really spread out here. Uh, you can play probably, you know, of the 26 teams, you could probably play 18 of them and and feel <laughs> and feel fine about it. You know what I mean? So a lot of stuff is in play here, uh, and that means there's going to be a lot of variance. So just kind of embrace it. Um, don't go broke in the last couple of weeks here, but enjoy it and keep an eye out for the projections, updates, and yeah, um, continued happy holiday season. Good luck.